Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kauf and I'm the Nerd on the Street and today we're talking about Yode. Just a quick disclaimer at the start of this video, Yode sent me a phone for free in exchange for taking a look at their project on this channel, but they are not providing me with any monetary payments and they did not restrict what I can or cannot say about them. All right, everyone, here in 2022, there are basically two major options that you have when it comes to choosing an operating system for your smartphone. Option number one is iOS from Apple, and option number two is Android from Google. Now, if you care about privacy and security, option number one, iOS, is really eliminated right off the bat because iOS is proprietary. Now, in the past, Apple has been pretty good with their talking points about privacy, and we haven't seen a lot of privacy infringing features implemented in Apple products. Products. Apple has this reputation for being sort of white glove, high end, you're not expecting a lot of privacy intrusive advertisements from them. And because they make money from their hardware, it would reason that they don't have to do as much in their software when it comes to data collection in order to make money. However, the fact that iOS is proprietary really is a huge issue, and it's not just ethical. Uh, you might remember last year, Apple very nearly implemented new features that would have started scanning every photo taken on every iOS device as well as every Mac, hashing that photo, comparing it to a database containing hashes of known illegal photos that Apple has collected in a database, and then alerting Apple if you have too many photos that match what they believe to be illegal. Now that feature was not officially canceled, but at least postponed after major pushback from technology news and mainstream news media and consumers and all of that. There was a big public outlash. There were security researchers saying this is a really bad idea, and so Apple did go ahead and put that off. They said they're still looking into how to implement those features, but they're going to try and do it in a more privacy respecting way, they say. Um, however, the reason I cite that as an example of iOS's proprietary nature being a problem is because if Apple had pushed that feature out and you own an iPhone, you don't get an option of whether or not you're going to have that feature on your iPhone. You either install the update and you get the feature that Apple gives you, or you stop installing updates altogether and you have an outdated and insecure phone. Because iOS is proprietary, nobody can fork it and remove those anti-features. So iOS is not an option if you actually care about privacy and security. On the other side of the fence, we have Android. It's open source, which is good for privacy and security, but it's owned by Google, which is bad for privacy and security. The AOSP, the Android open source project, actually doesn't contain a lot of privacy infringing things inherently. Uh, when it comes to Android phones collecting data, most of what you're going to be looking at is Google services collecting your data. Google Maps using your location services and sending that maybe even when you're not using the map so that Google can aggregate how many people are in different locations at different businesses at different times of the day. One of the oldest examples, Gmail scanning your emails and using it to provide you with contextually relevant advertisements. And of course on Android, the privacy concerns don't just come from Google themselves making Android. Privacy concerns also can occur with third-party applications. You know, when you install an app, you're presented with a big list of permissions that you're granting it. Um, and sometimes you've got apps that are social media apps such as Facebook or Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, whatever you're using that require things like location services that maybe you don't necessarily want to grant but the app developers have built in features that require those permissions and so you have to grant those permissions in order to use the app or at the very least in order to use certain features. So Android is open source, but it does have a lot of different places where privacy infringements can really creep in. And that's why I was really excited to hear about Yode. This is a distribution of Android. It's an Android based operating system. And Yode or the Yode OS as they refer to the operating system specifically on their website is specifically geared toward protecting your privacy while using your smartphone. A lot of the features built into Yode have to do with the built-in applications. Rather than Google Play, you're getting the Aurora App Store, which is, from what I understand, sort of a Google Play proxy. You're getting apps from Google Play without going directly through a Google account. And they also pre-install F-Droid, which is an open source alternative app store that you can also use on other Android devices, but Yode installs it by default. Yode includes a default set of applications that include all the things you would expect, like a web browser, or contacts, email app, but also includes some interesting things such as an ad blocker. And the browser that's included by default is actually a fork of Firefox.
Firefox with Mozilla's telemetry removed, which I approve of. So this is an Android distribution with a lot of privacy-friendly apps and features built in, including some patches to things that you won't find on other Android-based operating systems. Now, Yode is based on Lineage OS, so if you've used Lineage OS before, or what used to be known as Cyanogen Mod, uh, then you'll probably be familiar with a lot of the experience, or at least the concept of Yode. You're putting this onto a smartphone, it's replacing your stock operating system that the manufacturer put on there that was based on Android. And I have used Lineage OS in the past, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, a lot of people enjoy Lineage OS because it's very close to stock Android, but it does include some features that are helpful for privacy. It included granular controls over permissions before the upstream AOSP did. And I'm really interested personally to see how closely the experience of using Yode matches up with stock Android, how closely it matches up to using Lineage OS, and how close it is to actually matching a manufacturer's out-of-the-box experience on a smartphone. Now, the Yode operating system can be installed on any phone that you own if it's one of the phones that are supported by Yode. Now, Lineage OS over the years has actually dropped off support for the number of phones uh, that they're supporting at a given time. But Lineage OS still supports a lot of phones today, and Yode only supports a few in comparison. They've got a list on their website, and if you own one of the phones that they support, then you can download Yode and put it on your phone for free. Um, obviously, it's a free and open source project. However, Yode is a company based in France, and they sell refurbished and ecologically sourced new phones to fund their software operations, as I understand it. Now, Yode's website makes a lot of references in addition to privacy. They make a lot of references to ecology. And the reason why it would be more ecologically friendly uh, just to install Yode on your own phone, for instance, would be that you are refreshing that phone, giving it maybe more life versus buying a new phone because you don't like software features on that old one. So you're avoiding buying a new phone. You're avoiding technological waste. Uh, when it comes to the phones that they sell, like I said, they have a couple of new models that they sell, you know, shrink-wrapped, or at least not pre-owned. Um, and those are the TerraCube 2E, as well as the Fairphone 4 and the Fairphone 3. Uh, the Fairphone is a fairly high-profile niche Android phone. It's intended to be affordable, it's intended to be easily serviced, and they also try to be conscientious about their supply chain to make sure they're ethically sourcing their materials. TerraCube, maybe not quite as well-known of a name, but it's a similar concept. So Yode sells those phones with their Yode operating system pre-installed, and they also sell a select of third-party phones, including one that I've got right here in this box. The third-party phones are all refurbished, and so, you know, Yode can't go and ensure that other big-name companies are ethically sourcing their materials and, and whatnot, and making sure that phones are easily repairable so that you don't have to throw the whole thing out if something breaks on it. But by selling refurbished phones, once again, they can at least take a little bit of technological waste out of the environment. That's the hardware side of things that they aim to market for, it seems like. Now, I'm not someone who gives way too much thought, honestly, to the environmental side of things when I'm making purchases. Um, I am a, I'm a techie. I like to have new products. I like to have well-performing products. I like shiny new stuff, new tech. However, I'm also somebody who is frugal with my money, and I do use my phones for a very long time after I buy them. I use my computers for a very long time after I buy them. You know, this desktop sitting behind me is four years old, um, and I'm not intending to replace it for at least a few more years. My current phone that I use day to day is a OnePlus 5T, and I bought this in 2017, so it's five years old now, uh, much longer than your two-year contract that you would get from a normal carrier, after which they would try to upsell you to a new phone. And another Android device that I have in this apartment right now, my OnePlus 5T is not running Lenny OS. I never rooted it actually because I didn't root it when I first got it. And you know, once I had my apps on there and I started using it, I never wanted to go through the hassle of wiping the phone to unlock it, which is required in order to root it, unlocking the bootloader. So I never ended up rooting it and it's not running uh, Lineage OS and it is a pain sometimes not having root on this phone, which is part of the reason why having a rooted operating system pre-installed like Yode, I think can be a really valuable thing for people. But one of the other devices I have in this apartment is also a Samsung Galaxy Galaxy Tab S2 8.0. Um, I made a video about this when I unboxed it. I got it on release day back in 2015. I got it the day it was released. So once again, I like new shiny stuff, but at the same time, I'm very frugal. I still use this thing almost every single day. And it's been almost seven years now since I purchased this thing. Um, and I've started to worry about it actually dying because there aren't a lot of good eight inch tablet 
alternatives available right now. But that tablet is running Lineage OS. Um, it's not officially supported by Lineage OS though, it's a community build. And so I think the support of Lineage OS on specific devices by third parties commercially is a really good thing. And that's also something that Yode is doing. So those are the reasons why uh, when Yode reached out to me, I was really interested in taking a look at their product. Now I wanna mention very clearly, I should have mentioned this actually earlier, but Yode sent me this Xiaomi Mi 10T for free and they're letting me keep it in exchange for covering their product on this video. They are not paying me in any way other than letting me keep the phone and they have not placed any restrictions on what I can or cannot say about them or their products. I don't allow those sort of restrictions on my videos. So in this video, you are going to be getting my opinion, my actual impressions about the project. But that is a bit of an intro. That's what we're taking a look at here. If you're interested in a privacy centric smartphone or at least a privacy respecting smartphone, this might be it. Let's open up the box and see what we find. All right, guys, so this is the box we're looking at. The only thing I have done before starting this video was I cut open the plastic on the front here and removed the import documents that had my address on them because if my address is in a video, then I have to rotoscope it out and then the video takes a thousand years to finish. You can see at the top though that this thing is from France. Uh, now it is interesting to note, Yode only sells phones to Europe right now. They do not sell to the United States. They don't sell to anywhere in North America. They don't sell to Australia and they don't sell to Eastern Asia. They're really only marketing the phones that they sell to people in Europe right now. However, they were still interested enough in me and my audience to send a phone out here. And while talking with them, it really sounds like Yode doesn't mind too much how many sales they're getting. They care more about getting their operating system out there and getting more users. As somebody working for a company who develops an open source operating system and makes most of its money off of hardware sales, I understand the business model and I do think it's a little interesting that they're not even and they don't have plans to expand to North America for selling their actual devices. Uh, but like I said, if you've got one of their supported models, they want you as a user. You just have to install the operating system on it yourself. So I've got a pocket knife here. Before we even get to the pocket knife, I guess we can take a look at this. Um, it actually says on the plastic, pull up here to collect the document. So obviously I didn't do that. I just cut the plastic open, but we can pull this label off. And I'm wondering if that will also remove any of the tape holding the package together. Interesting. So I'm not sure what kind of box this is exactly. I don't speak French. Um, if I had to guess, this is very similar to the United States priority mailboxes that the USPS uses. So this could just be a generic box from the French Postal Service. There's an arrow here. Um, okay. So I don't know what that says, but I'm guessing it says something like pull tab to open or push tab to open. Um, if I push down into there, it, I mean, it's perforated almost. I almost think I should have pulled it instead of pushed it, but it wasn't popping out of the box, so I couldn't. All right, guys, and a really stupid thing just happened. I paused the camera for a moment to go and grab my pocket knife to help me get this box open, and when I came back, apparently I didn't turn the camera back on again. So I just unboxed this phone and recorded about an hour of footage talking, and I've got all the audio, but I don't have any video. That was entirely a flub on my part, and I feel terrible about it, and that's why I reset the phone to factory settings, packaged it, back up into the box exactly how it came the first time. And I'm gonna unbox it now a second time. And this actually benefits you guys as viewers because you're gonna get a more brief and fast paced video. So I did figure out how to open the box. Uh, at least I figured out a way to open the box. I ended up just pulling the bottom flap open here. As you can see, it was glued or it adhered. Uh, there's really no better way to open the box. The sides of it are folded over so there's nothing to slide out. And yeah, the, the perforation that's sort of seen for folding on some of the edges does not go uh, across any entire surface. So you really just have to pull it open. And this was just a shipping box. Um, inside of here, we do have a Yode branded inner box. So I really like this box. I like the presentation. I like the graphic design of this box. Just taking a look around on the left, we've got some key features of Yode, the first one being Android without snitches. Now, one thing that I did take note of in some of the messaging on the box is that the English is not always quite correct. Like I said, Yode is a French company and I actually went back and forth with them. They sent me the email that they send to their first time buyers, sort of explaining some of the key points of Yode. And that introductory welcome email also had some incorrect English. And I let them know, I pointed out uh, the mistakes they were making and I actually explained grammatically why they were incorrect, which I like to do so people know I'm not 
just lying to them. And they've gone ahead and corrected those for the email. Now with print, it's a little bit more difficult. I don't know how many of these box sleeves they have printed. And I'm not gonna bore you guys with grammatical details, but just to point out a couple things, uh, data requests analysis, We'll take a look at this later. Yode is able to monitor the data requests the different apps are making, and it doesn't just block them, but it actually presents them to you so you can see what they're doing, which is pretty cool. Uh, but this should be either data request analysis or analysis of data requests. If the words are in this order, then requests should not have an S on the end. Things get a little worse as we keep going down here. Unwanted transmissions blocking. Once again, it should either be unwanted transmission blocking or blocking of unwanted transmissions. Um, and then privacy-friendly apps selection should probably be privacy-friendly app selection or selection of privacy-friendly apps. You only have a plural with these kinds of statements if that's the last word of the phrase. Now on the back here, we've got some short explanations about why you might choose Yode. Obviously, number one, it protects your privacy. We've talked about that and we will continue to talk about that quite a bit. This sentence here, Yode relies on open source components, guarantee of transparency and ethics. Uh, there should probably be an A there. So this is a guarantee of transparency and ethics. They do point out that Yode's income comes exclusively from the sale of smartphones. So like I said, I do think it's really interesting that they're not super concerned about selling phones, at least from my impression. Uh, like I said, they really wanted me to emphasize in the video more the software side of things, and they care about people using their software on your phone, whether you're a customer of theirs or not. And that is a really good thing to see. It means that they care about what they're doing. It's just a little confusing in terms of business model. And if I didn't mention it earlier, Yode does only ship to Europe. So if you want to support them financially right now, you have to be in that target market area. Uh, but if you're not in that target market area, you can still download the operating system and install it yourself. Like I said, if you've got one of the models of phone that supports it. Like I said, I've got the Xiaomi Mi 10T here. Um, and this is actually a phone from a Chinese manufacturer that you cannot buy in the US right now uh, because of ongoing trade issues. You can't buy it directly from the manufacturer, uh, but you can buy it from other third parties except not Yode because they don't ship here. Second, Yode protects the environment. Uh, Yode gives a second life to working smartphones. So once again, if you are using an older smartphone that's gotten bogged down with bloat and software, um, if you're able to put Yode on it and keep using it rather than throwing it out, you have just prevented a phone from going into a landfill. If you buy a refurbished phone, you have prevented this phone from going into a landfill. They also point out Yode reduces energy consumption by blocking unwanted transmissions. Uh, this is something I've heard touted before about things like ad blockers. Obviously, Obviously, it's not the main reason you use blockers. You were mainly concerned about keeping control of the data and taking care of annoyances in the user experience. But technically, you know, if trackers aren't being sent or received, that is going to use a little bit less power. If everybody was using a Yode smartphone, then it would add up and be a significant difference. And finally, they say that Yode promotes European know-how. Um, it says the software is designed by a European team of experts in IT security and design. So most people these days, I think, would typically trust a company based in Europe more than a company based in the US when it comes to data privacy. Now, Western Europe can still be very much in the realm of data collection agencies and government agencies being able to operate, but being developed in Europe might be a pro to some people. Um, along those lines, this phone was refurbished in France, and then we've got some items about the refurbishing process. Um, the first time I looked at this, it was unclear to me what these second and third points meant because it's not really clear that they're connected to the first point. You know, on the other side, we've got uh, four distinct selling points of the phone, or maybe these three points are connected to the first point on that side as well. But over here, there's no visual indicator that these different pictures are related. So certified autonomy is a very vague phrase. If I tell you that my phone has certified autonomy, you might think that it's able to walk around and do things on its own because that's what being autonomous kind of means. But judging by the picture, I take it they're talking about the battery life. They certify that the battery life is appropriate uh, as part of their refurbishing process. And the refurbishing process presumably has 40 plus control points to make sure that it's a reasonably refurbished phone. Now this phone was refurbished with grade A aesthetic quality. They sell grade A and grade B and I requested the better grade grade A and I did that because I was very interested to see how good it would actually look um, as somebody who does care about my technology and cares about how my technology looks to other people to a certain extent. You know I'm not buying a phone just because I think it would look cool to have the phone but I don't want to have a phone that looks super beat up especially not from right when I'm 
bought it. So I do think it's important to show you exactly what level of aesthetic quality you're getting when it comes to the refurbished devices. Um, on the top of this inner box, we've got a bunch of regulatory text in French, which I cannot read. On the bottom, I'm going to cover up the IMEI number with my thumb here, but we do have the full model of the phone. Like I said, it's a Xiaomi Mi 10T 5G 128 gigabyte storage model. And if I was buying a phone for myself, I would probably go with the 10T Pro. But the only difference between the 10T and the 10T Pro are that the Pro has a little bit more RAM and twice as much storage. And the RAM and storage in this thing are very much uh, competitive with what I was already using in my OnePlus 5T that I mentioned earlier in the video. So that is the outer sleeve of the box. We can slide the sleeve off here and it's a very plain white box, nothing else printed on it anywhere. So we can open this thing up and it does appear that Yode repackages the phones that they send out. Now, as you can see here, the box is mostly made of cardboard. The phone is in a little bit of plastic itself and we can sort of pop up one of these flaps to take the phone out of the cardboard. Um, so the phone is wrapped in a little bit of plastic. I've put it on as best I can the way that it was the first time. And we're gonna set that phone off to the side for just a second, we'll get back to it. Now underneath that, we get some accessories, which is nice. Um, Yode sent a Yode case and it's a pretty nice case. The back of it is wood. Uh, this wording on here, this is not just visual. This is a fairly decently indented logo here. Um, so that logo is not going to come off or wear off even if the rest of this case gets scratched up. On the other side, we've got a little bit of a pattern and we've got a little logo here. Um, I do kind of wonder if this is a rebranded case. Obviously somebody manufactured it, but it could be an off the shelf thing that they just added the logo to, but it's, it's nice that they include it in any case. Um, now underneath that, I've got some things that surprised me a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I knew was coming in the box was a charger. So this is a European wall charger, which obviously I can't use here, but that's fine because the phone just charges over USB. I've got plenty of charges already. And that exact reason is why they actually don't ship chargers with the two new phones that they sell, the Fairphone and the TerraCube. With either of the Fairphone models, the three or the four, and the TerraCube 2E, their website notes that there is no charger in the box. Um, and you know, when you're purchasing a flagship smartphone from a company like Apple, if they don't include a charger, I consider that kind of cheap of them and lazy of them. Um, Apple says they were doing it for ecological benefits, but if you're paying that much money for a brand new phone from the manufacturer, and it's a mainstream device, I really expect a charger in the box. Um, now I understand for companies like Fairphone or TerraCube that are specifically marketing to be ecologically friendly, why they might want to omit chargers. Uh, once again, because you probably already have some chargers, but if you don't, it is an added expense to go and get one. And inside of this bag, there is also a SIM card removal tool that we will use in a few minutes. Now, the thing that surprised me more that was in here was actually these headphones. Um, so we get a pair of headphones and they've got a little remote on them so you can adjust your volume and everything from the headphones. Um, and that's kind of neat, but not necessarily something that I need. I don't use headphones with my phone very often. Uh, my phone, though, I do use it very often in the car, plugging it into my car stereo. I use it for that very often, especially when I'm going on long trips. It's entirely necessary for me to have that feature. And this phone actually does not have a 2.5 inch jack. Um, it's got a USB-C jack on the bottom that we'll see in a moment, and there is no standard headphone jack on the phone. So I think that's why they actually included these headphones, because these are actually USB Type-C headphones. Um, so those plug into the USB Type-C port. Now, like I said, I don't really use my phone as an iPod. I don't use it as an MP3 player. I don't walk around with headphones in, um, and so I'm not using headphones really regularly. I use headphones with my tablet, actually, which I only use in my apartment, uh, but I never use headphones out on the go with my phone. My phone only plugs into that 3.5 inch auxiliary jack in my car. And for that reason, I actually would have preferred if instead of including headphones, they had included just a USB-C to 3.5 inch adapter. Um, it's nice that they include these headphones. You can see a little bit of information maybe about the specific type of headphones they included there. And I don't know if these actually came from Xiaomi and they just threw them in this box or if it came from Yode. But either way, uh, I do think it's an inconvenience not to have 3.5 inch out. And I thought it was interesting that they were including these. Um, so I would assume actually that it's probably coming just from the Xiaomi box and that's why it was included. And that's probably also why they do include chargers with their refurbished phones because it's probably Fairphone and TerraCube for those new phones making the decision not to include a charger. I'm not sure if that's a decision that Yode specifically made or not. But yeah, those are all of the accessories that we get. The box is pretty nice. Um, this bottom flap of cardboard comes up 
here, but you know, it's pretty solid cardboard. It doesn't feel like it's about to tear or anything. It's well constructed. Obviously the whole thing's cardboard. That means it's all pretty recyclable um, and made out of renewable materials. So no styrofoam, no plastic on most of this. So we can go ahead and set that stuff off to the side for a moment and we can take a look at the phone itself. Um, now there's a tab on the bottom of the plastic here and pulling that will not do much because there, there's no opening on the plastic itself. It actually started to tear the plastic um, as you can see and it was already a little bit torn actually when I got it. But I figured out how to open the plastic up here a little bit better on the back there were some flaps of plastic that come open. So that's how you're supposed to open the plastic if you wanna keep the plastic intact, is from the back, not via that confusing flap on the front. Now here we have the Xiaomi Mi 10T. Uh, like I said, this, this video is mainly about the IOTA operating system or the Yode operating system. Apologies if I've pronounced it wrong any number of times by now. So I'm not gonna focus way too much on the hardware, but you know, it's a phone that they're offering. On the back, we've got the Xiaomi logo and model number written there. And then we've also got some regulatory symbols. There is no IOTA branding on this thing. Um, it would be interesting if they were able to laser engrave their nice IOTA logo on this thing or something. Not necessarily something you need, but it would be interesting, like I said. Instead, we get sort of a plain phone that's just got the manufacturer's branding on it, so if you do want to rep Yode, you can put it in the case, which I will probably be doing. Um, the back of this particular phone is sort of that buffered chrome look. It reminds me of an old iPod Touch, um, like a second gen or a fourth gen iPod Touch. I had some of those, and I remember them scratching incredibly easily. Um, so it will be interesting to see how much this thing scratches. Uh, those scratched even when they were in cases. Um, so I am gonna put this thing in a case, and it won't matter too much what it actually looks like. Uh, but yeah, definitely, this is a very reflective surface. Um, you know, I, I can sort of angle it and you can see the blue decorative acoustic panels that I have on my wall. I say they're decorative because they don't work very well, but you're definitely getting color off of the reflections of this. It does look kind of silver, uh, just reflecting off the white wall, but it's, it's definitely sort of a mirrored surface. This phone came with no protective plastic on the screen or on the back or on the camera lens. The only plastic that came on it was sort of the plastic wrapping over it, uh, which maybe it was a little bit tighter the first time I opened it up, but it was packaged very similarly to what I just showed you. It was not uh, way tighter or anything. So seems like it was hand applied. And there is a little bit of scuffing that was here the first time as well. This was not scuffing that I caused, but right around the edge of the camera bump. Uh, you know, these modern phones, they have camera bumps because they want to have cameras and lenses on the cameras that are a certain thickness, uh, but they don't want to make the whole phone thick enough to actually fit the lens. So they put a camera bump on the phone um, and that has side effects like making the phone wobble around when you set it on a flat surface. And when the phone is wobbling around and just when it's sliding over things, sliding in and out of a pocket, that kind of thing, the camera bump is going to take a lot of the wear and tear that you're going to see before the rest of the phone. So there is some scuffing around the edge, the outer edge of the camera bump here, uh, but that's really the only visual issue that I see cosmetically with this phone. The screen is not scratched up and even the back, you know, I was wondering if the back would be super scratched up. I was expecting most of this to be kind of more scratched than it is, but it's really all pretty pristine other than just having some, some dotted scuffs around the edge of the camera bump. So with that quick overview, we will go ahead and turn the phone on using the power button on the side here. And we're going to get a Xiaomi logo and an Android logo first. We're not going to see the Yode logo until a few seconds later. And here we have the Yode logo coming up. Nice little intro animation there. They throw their website on the screen during the splash screen, which is interesting, but they are at yode.tech. And this is the first page of their setup wizard. Having the camera circle in the top left of the screen is sort of new to me. I've never had a phone that had a notch or any sort of camera in the screen. Now here on this first page, I do think it's very polite um, and very good natured of Yode to say that they're powered by Lineage OS. And I don't know if there were any sort of trademark or redistribution factors that required them to do that, but they probably could have gotten away with just branding this as Yode. You know, in the Linux distribution space, we've got distros that don't necessarily market that they are based on other distros. And there's nothing inherently wrong with doing that. If it's open source software, you're allowed to use it. However, in this case, with the Android operating system, Lineage OS, as the successor to CyanogenMod, is the most well-known, I would bet, third-party ROM for Android. And so I think that it really helps Yode and Lineage both by including them in this setup wizard. Because if you're a Yode user, this is exposing you to the Lineage OS 
logo so you kind of know that your operating system is based on lineage and if you've got uh, you know if you look up help articles online or things like that um, information that applies to lineage will generally apply to Yode and then on the other hand it also helps Yode out because people who are used to lineage OS like myself will know that they'll be getting a semi-familiar experience with Yode so that is nice of them and we'll go ahead and tap start here I do think it's interesting that they default the language to English United States when they don't ship to the United States and most most of their marketing materials default to French. Obviously, they have English as an option, uh, but not US English on their website and things like that. So I wasn't sure at first if the phone was using the wireless signals from cell towers around here to figure out where I am um, and guess the language or if it was really just their software default, but I think it's just the software default because the next page, uh, well, it's going to ask me my date and time, so they certainly don't know where I am. And despite defaulting the language to English US, they default the time zone to Paris. Uh, which is incorrect. We are currently in the cursed time zone of mountain time. The current date is incorrect. Um, it's currently April 14th. And the current time is also incorrect. It is currently 2.15 p.m. And I think it's interesting also that they put the language and the date and time first because the next step is to search for a Wi-Fi network. Now I'm gonna set the phone down because I've got Wi-Fi networks around here that either are named inappropriate things because my neighbors are idiots or that expose my location with their names. And so I'm going to cover up all of the Wi-Fi networks other than my own. But you know, if they put Wi-Fi first, then they could probably connect to an NTP server and set the time that way. Of course, doing that might be a privacy concern. So maybe that's entirely intentional. Um, either way, I'm gonna tap on Knott's Wireless here and I'm going to attempt to connect. All right, so I just typed in my password there and the reason I say attempt to connect is because last time I went through this process, the phone actually didn't connect. Now there's something really interesting here. Um, if we tap under advanced options, you'll see under the privacy section, the default setting is to use a randomized MAC address. Now, if you don't know what a MAC address is, any device on a network communicates using several different types of addresses. The address at layer three of a network is the IP address, and that one lets you talk to people on other networks. But on your own local network, devices use a MAC address to decide where to send traffic. Uh, when your router or your access point receives traffic and it wants to send it to this phone, it does it using the MAC address. Now, the MAC address is actually kind of a privacy concern, especially with phones. With normal computers, you plug a computer into a network, the MAC address is burned into your hardware, um, so it's, you know, it's not assigned, you don't have to set it, but it never changes, but that's not normally a problem on your own network. However, with a phone in particular, you're walking around, you're connecting to other people's networks, you're connecting to hotspots at restaurants and at events, and the MAC address can actually be evidence that you were somewhere, or at least that your phone was in use somewhere, uh, because if a network administrator has logs of a device with your phone's MAC address connecting to their network at a certain time, you know, they can tell law enforcement agencies that you were at that particular area, or at least somebody using your phone was in that area at that time. And obviously, in addition to law enforcement, that information can potentially be breached by third parties or used by first party corporations for other uses, advertisement, targeting, that kind of thing. So there's all kinds of reasons why you would not want people to track you using your MAC address. Um, and so I think it's actually really cool that they default to using a randomized MAC address uh, on this phone. You know, my current Android phone doesn't do this. Um, and I, I have been conscious of it. I've never had a huge problem with it, you know, uh, but I, whenever I connect to a network out in public, I do think about, okay, well, there's a log of me being here now because I'm not randomizing my Mac address. I have thought about that before. Um, and so that's really cool that they do that. If you don't want to use that, you can use the device's hardware burned in Mac address instead. I'm going to try using the randomized Mac address option. Now, last time I did this, uh, the connection did not work successfully, but I think it had to do with my hotspot more than the phone. Yeah, see, it just says saved. It doesn't say that we're connected. So the hotspot in my apartment right now uh, is actually my desktop computer. I don't have a dedicated wireless hotspot. I'm just sharing the wired connection going into my computer using the network manager applet on that computer. Um, now, I, I have had problems with some Linux systems recently no longer connecting to that hotspot. So I think this is probably something similar. Um, I did try last time I unboxed the phone. I tried connecting to my old phone over a Wi-Fi 
access point, a hotspot that I set up for tethering on that. And that one worked successfully. So the phone does connect to Wi-Fi. It's not connecting to this Wi-Fi hotspot right now. Um, but we're not going to bother with that. We're not going to bother setting up that tethering on my other phone because I'm about to take the SIM card out anyway, and then it won't have internet through that hotspot anyway. So that would be kind of pointless. Um, now I am going to daily driver this phone for a little while. I'm not sure if I'm going to daily driver it indefinitely, or if I'm just going to check it out and then go back to my other one. I really like my current phone. Um, I, I really, really like my OnePlus 5T. I have no complaints with it. It started slowing down a little bit. Actually, there is there are some bugs that have shown up uh, in the last couple of software updates from OnePlus, and they have discontinued software updates for this phone. So it's probably for the best if I get off of it, but I had been considering putting Lineage OS on it, which would make it last much longer. But either way, obviously, to take a look at the phone and review it properly, I am at least going to use it for a little while. Now, we're going to grab our SIM card removal tool out of this bag. And the SIM card removal tool, the first time that I opened this up, I was very accurate repackaging all of this uh, because the SIM card removal tool was kind of stuck into the same plastic loop as the power cable, um, which might be so that it's easier to get out than having to fish around in this gigantic bag for a tiny little SIM card removal tool. But we're gonna take that removal tool and we are going to find the SIM card tray of my old phone here. There it is. So this is a Ting SIM card that I have. Uh, you might see me blurring out numbers on it that would be potentially identifying, but that is my old SIM card. My old phone supported two SIM cards. I never used that dual SIM functionality, but it was nice that it was there. And then the new phone has its SIM card tray on the bottom. So we'll stick that removal tool in there, take that tray out. We'll drop it on the desk. And it took me a minute to figure out how to put the SIM card into the new tray because the new tray is kind of upside down. You want to put the SIM card into this Mi 10T tray uh, so that the contact is facing towards you. And then we put the tray back in. All right, so we've just done that. We'll wake the phone back up and we'll see in a moment here if it detects my network again. It did earlier. Um, so you can see it knows we have a network connection to our cellular data provider in the top right. Um, however, it's not going on to the next page automatically, which is strange. We have to manually tap next, even though we're already connected. As you can see, it knows that there's a SIM card in there. Um, like I said, I have Ting as my mobile service provider. They use T-Mobile cell towers. They're sort of a cheaper reseller. And so I'm going to turn that on. And this is interesting. The phone has frozen. This did not happen the first time. Okay, so volume things still show up. Um, next, turn on cellular data. Okay, it doesn't want to continue if we do turn on cellular data. So we'll continue without turning it on for now, I guess. Uh, location services. Like I said, last time that didn't happen. It let me continue after turning on data last time, but I was also connected to Wi-Fi, so uh, I really don't know what that's about. Location services, uh, there is a space missing here after the first sentence, before the second sentence. They have a space before this last sentence, so they, they recognize that grammatical construct of spaces between sentences, uh, but it is missing one after the initial bold sentence there. But they're asking you about enabling location services. They say apps you install that have asked your permission as well as system apps will be allowed to use your location information. I would expect that Yode is going to give us more granular control over that location access. Getting a phone call, probably from a spammer. I would expect that Yoda is going to give you more granular control over location access than stock Android, at least. They don't mention any of that here, though. Uh, we'll tap next. Fingerprint setup, we'll go ahead and set that up. Uh, first, we need to set up a regular lock screen pattern. Just on the video here, I'm going to set it to E, the last letter in Yoda, since I can't really make an I with this pattern. And then I'll change that pattern later obviously. Um, now for unlocking with the fingerprint, it tells you to touch the sensor. And this is an issue on all Android um, distributions. I've seen this on Lineage OS with plenty of other phone devices. Um, but my old phone, the OnePlus 5T, it had the fingerprint sensor in my favorite place to put it, the back middle. Um, and this was also where the power button was on the LG G2. LG was a, a low profile trendsetter by putting a power button there for the first time. But Nexus phones these days also put the, or Pixel phones put the fingerprint sensor in the back middle there, but other phones don't. You know, OnePlus has phones where the fingerprint sensor is 
in the screen, you've got Samsung phones where the fingerprint sensor is in the bottom middle. And then this Xiaomi phone has a fingerprint sensor on the side. The power button is right here and that power button is the fingerprint sensor. So it would be nice. I'm not saying that it needs to detect what model of phone you have and tell you the correct location of that sensor, uh, but it would be nice if the wizard at least listed a couple different places to look for it instead of just telling you to use the sensor on the back of the phone because obviously there's no sensor on the back of the phone here. So if you don't know what you're looking for, such as like my, I could imagine my parents getting confused by that. They're, they would get stuck looking for a fingerprint sensor that doesn't exist. Um, fingerprint added, okay, so that's done. I'm not going to restore my apps and data here. Um, and then we've got another section of the wizard. I guess this is the section that is Yode specific. So we'll tap start and it says, welcome to Yode. Um, so there's three buttons here and then a, a button to enter the OS. Once again, let's go. There should not be a space uh, before that last exclamation point there. So it makes it feel a little more clunky and obvious that it was designed by people who don't speak English natively when things like that happen. But we do have some cool features here. We can select our pre-installed apps and we have a big list of lots of different apps that come pre-installed with this phone. So most phones you're going to get pre-installed apps, uh, but you don't really get to choose what's there and what's not. If you're able to uninstall any of them, you have to do that after the initial setup and some of them you might not be able to remove at all. Um, so Yoda gives you a lot of options here. You can really, you can disable a lot of built-in stuff. Uh, we've got two app stores to start with. We've got Aurora store, which like I said, that's going to let you access apps from Google Play. Um, and then F-Droid is a, a secondary app store, mainly for open source apps. We've got the browser, the Firefox fork that I mentioned earlier. We've got a very strangely named email client. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I would guess PMEP if I had to guess, but that's not an equal sign. It's too many lines. So not sure exactly where that comes from. Uh, Magic Earth is the maps and navigation app here. Now, the one thing that I am still reliant on Google on is Google Maps. Um, and that this is my biggest concern with this phone and what I'm most excited to see with this phone is how well this Magic Earth app works. Um, I read online on Yode's OS information page that Magic Earth is the only app that they pre-installed that is not entirely open source. And so I'm wondering if this will be better than some of the, the open street map options that are out there because those open street map options, I support what they're doing, but there's just not enough data on open street map to really be a competitor to Google Maps. There are too many places that aren't there, too many roads that aren't there, um, the features that are missing, like being able to avoid highways, avoid interstate highways, which when talking with European developers, they might not understand those feature requests because words like highways have a different meaning in the US than they do in Europe. But yeah, I'm very interested. I will be using Magic Earth um, and seeing if I need to fall back to Google Maps or if this will actually work for me. Um, we've got micro G services. So these are services that are providing Google functionality, but some of these are actually also faking Google functionality to make the phone work as you would expect. We've got a fake uh, Google Play Store provider here. Some apps will not run if they detect they're on a phone without Google Play. And so we have to fake that um, in order for those to work. And it's really nice that that stuff is built in because that means the phone is going to work closer to how you would expect as an end consumer without having to do a bunch of tweaking. It's really important that that stuff works well out of the box. So I'm glad they include that stuff. Um, we've got stock AOSP apps for multimedia. I recognize a lot of the icons for those. Um, I don't recognize PDF Viewer Plus. That's an interesting one uh, at the bottom there. And then we've got a weather. Um, and this page is a little bit tight design-wise at the bottom with no bottom margin to the page. But that is all of the apps. I'm going to leave them all enabled by default. Next, we're going to check out Discover Yode Blocker. And this is a pretty cool app. This is that app that lets you see connections that apps are making. So it's not just blocking things, but it's actually tracking them for you. Uh, we can go to our report here. We can see the only item in here so far is micro G services. There were two items in here last time I ran through this, but the other one probably didn't try to make any requests because we don't have internet yet. Now on this report, tab, there, there are numbers here. There's zero and 10 at the end of that line. I don't know what those numbers mean because there's no unit. Uh, I don't know what that would be 10 of, you know, zero to 10, 10 what? This looks like about two on the scale, but I don't know what it's actually talking about, uh, but we can tap on it to see, and it appears that it's actually telling us requests that it's made. So the micro G services core app has made a request to android.clients.google.com and to mtalk google.com presumably both IP addresses that are geolocated in the US, according to whatever database that's pulled from. 
Um, under stream, we've got a list of all of the requests that have been made along with the, the source app and the recipient URL. Um, and if, you, if there was more than one app that had been sending things, they would all show up in the stream here. Uh, we also have a map. Um, oh, it's populated this time. It wasn't populated last time uh, that I did this. It's centered on France, uh, even though I'm in the US, so we can move that right back over here. Um, except I don't know, it, it doesn't appear to actually place those on the map anywhere, so I'm not sure what that visual map is for, uh, but there is a map, and then we've got some settings. Um, we can change individual apps from standard to reinforced mode, which might, uh, might actually start blocking things rather than just tracking them. We've also got customized protection. You can, uh, it looks like you can actually block specific apps or allow specific apps to talk to the same URLs, which is Pretty cool that you've got that fine-grained functionality in there. Finally, we've got a news and informations button. Once again, this should be check our news and information. Um, informations is never plural in English that I'm aware of anyway. Um, this defaults to the bottom of the list. Newer news comes last. And we do have a, an update available uh, two days ago, which was after this thing was shipped. So I will be looking at what the update process looks like in a little bit. Oh, and in there, we've also got an FAQ section I missed the first time. Uh, it looks like the same FAQs from their website. So we can tap let's go and we're into the Android OS. Now I am going to need internet to really start getting into using the phone here. Um, I am going to turn on the dark theme, just search dark theme in settings, I'll turn that on. And that looks a lot nicer on the drop downs in my opinion. So yeah, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and troubleshoot my Wi-Fi, figure out why this thing's not connecting to my preferred Wi-Fi. Uh, once again, I don't think that's anything to do with the, the OS or the phone. Um, even when I turned off the Mac randomization option, it still didn't want to connect to my preferred Wi-Fi network. Yeah, it's just not having that. Failed to connect to network, yeah. So I'll have to see what's going on there. But I'm gonna do that, and then I'll be back to just show you guys a little bit more here of my first impressions on the phone. Looking for the power button, there we go. All right guys, and it is a fair bit later in the day. Um, I have rebuilt my Wi-Fi access point on my computer, and as you can see, I am successfully connected now. If we pull down our menu here, uh, we do have Wi-Fi, so that's great. With that in mind, I'm going to turn mobile data off for now, although I will need it to work long term. And this evening I'd just like to take a little bit of a look around this phone. Um, there's a reason I wanted to get this phone unboxed today. Today is a Thursday. Uh, this weekend I'm attending a convention here in Colorado and I know from the last time I attended a convention that I'm going to be using my phone a lot at the convention. I'm going to be taking pictures, I'm going to be uh, looking up both things related to the schedule for the convention as well as just killing time on the phone between events at the convention. And so I thought it would be a really great opportunity to actually test my phone out because I don't use my phone a whole lot. Um, you know, my, my OnePlus 5T here, if we take a look, um, my home screen, it's mainly just messaging stuff. I do have four different web browsers installed and I browse Reddit, you know, from time to time on that when I'm killing time in particular. But yeah, for the most part, I don't actually use my phone all that much. I've got Telegram on it, but I've got that on my desktop computer as well. So when I'm really, when I'm texting people that I care about and talking on the phone even uh, with people that I care about, I'm usually doing that on a computer and not a phone. I've obviously got SMS text messages for some people that I interact with, but most of the things that I do on my phone, I would just do on my computer whenever I'm here in the apartment. Um, and I don't get out of my apartment all that often. So like I said, I thought it would be a really great opportunity this weekend with the convention coming up to really test drive Yode, see how it performs as a mobile operating system, see how easy it is to use, um, see if there's anything I can't do with it that I would normally do, that kind of thing. So with that in mind, the first thing I wanna do is go ahead and install that update that we saw earlier before we start playing around too much. I'm going to guess that's somewhere around either the about section, nope. Um, and I'm probably going to block out some of that page just once again because it has IMEI numbers and things like that. Uh, so it's probably in the system section then. Uh, no, not seeing, okay, yeah, it was under the more section, so updater, if we refresh. Uh, so this looks like the, the lineage OS updater, uh, but it says Yode OS or Yode, yeah, Yode. I'm still thrown off because I wanna pronounce it Iode, but Yode. Uh, so we'll go ahead and tap download here. We'll see what this experience looks like. I'm not sure what recovery they use on these phones. Um, if it's like Lineage OS's recovery or if it's their own thing. Uh, usually I prefer Twerp recovery 
Um, and the recovery is sort of the, not exactly a bootloader, but in the way that you interact with it, it's sort of like a pre-boot environment that you can use to back up Android phones, restore them, and also install packages on them. And normally when I install Lineage OS via Twerp Recovery, I have to install Lineage OS and then I separately have to install the Google services package. Uh, this phone, I actually, you know, I'm realizing now I didn't have to sign into my Google account when I was going through the setup. Um, I'm not sure it even gave me the opportunity to sign into a Google account when I was going through the setup. That's that's perfectly fine. Um, I am interested how it's going to handle apps. You know, while that's downloading, we can go ahead and take a look at uh, the app stores. So we've got the Aurora store here. How are you? Oh, how you doing? Okay, that's very bad English. <laughs> how you doing? That sounds like something a gangster would say. Uh, terms of service for Aurora store. Interesting. Let's read the terms of service. It's going to open up in the Firefox fork here. Been a little while since I used Firefox. I switched to Brave quite a while ago, uh, both on my desktop and my mobile. I've still got Firefox installed um, and a thousand tabs open in it that I intend to eventually bookmark. Um, it looks like we can sign into Firefox Sync. That's Firefox Sync or Mozilla Sync, yeah. If I wanted to sync this, I, I could. I'm going to try and install Brave on the phone just because I, I prefer its built-in ad blocking capabilities uh, being based on the Blink engine and being run by what I consider to be a slightly more competent open source organization. But let's take a look at the Aurora store terms of service here. Um, accepting these terms. So we're on a GitLab for Aurora OSS. So this is not necessarily Yoday's terms of service, but they include Aurora store by default. Um, if you access or use the service, it means you agree to be bound by all the terms below. Changes to these terms, privacy policy, copyright policy, third-party services. We provide users with the ability to use anonymous accounts within Aurora Store provided from our server as tokens. Your use of the service agrees not to affect our server in any way deemed harmful or with malicious intent. We may occasionally ask contributors to provide us with accounts. You hereby acknowledge that the accounts you make for Aurora Store to be given entire access to Aurora OSS and to be stored on our server. This does not apply to non-anonymous accounts. Interesting. So it sounds like if you don't want to use a Google account at all, maybe there are anonymous Aurora store owned Google accounts, which sounds like it would probably be against Google's terms of service, uh, which they probably mentioned somewhere in their liability disclosures here. Personally, uh, downloading apps, I, I am fine signing into my Google account to download apps. It is some data that Google's getting, but I would... You know, that's not at the top of my priority list. Google knowing everywhere I go with Google Maps is sort of an issue, but uh, the app thing is not at the top of my list. Let's go ahead and tap accept. Source code, license, privacy policy, disclaimer, next. Okay, select a suitable installer. Session-based installer for bundled and split APKs. Best suited for devices running Android 5.0+, plus, which Android 5.0 is quite old at this point, I think. Um, and so that's probably what we want. Root installer for background installations. Hmm. I mean, that's no root access. Oh, interesting. So is this phone not rooted by default? I assumed it would be, but it doesn't appear to be. Um, Aurora service installer for background installations. Okay. And we don't have the Aurora service installed either. By background installations, I, I think I know what session installer means. I've got F-Droid on my tablet with Lineage OS, and I also have the Google Play Store on that. But when I install apps with the Google Play Store, I can just tap install, and it installs an app. When I install apps via F-Droid, it pops up a full screen message that says, you are about to install XYZ. Do you want to continue? And it has a cancel and an install button. And that's a system level thing. It's sort of like a user account control on Windows, where it's like, meant to not be able to be overlaid by other apps so that you can't be tricked into clicking install on something you didn't mean to install. So I assume that's what session installer means, or maybe that's the native installer. Uh, we'll see here because I would have assumed that they would include, if they're including the Aurora store, the Aurora store's supporting service uh, would be included, but apparently it's not. It looks like we've also got an option called app manager. So we've got three of the five options on this screen we don't have the ability to actually use out of the box. Uh, we can follow the system theme, that's fine. Accent, um, I'm not sure why the app store needs its own accent. That one looks okay. Select a suitable installer. We already, didn't we already select an installer? External storage access granted. External storage manager is already granted. Installer permissions, we will grant permissions to install from the source. Uh, we'll tap next a few times until it decides to continue. Well, we might be stuck. Okay, now it says finish, so we had to go back and then forward again. That was a little bug in their uh, setup wizard. 
You need to log in first. Okay, so we can log in using a Google account or we can log in anonymously uh, or anonymously in an insecure manner. I'm not sure what that means. Um, I know for a fact there are apps I'm going to want from my Google account. Um, actually, I mean, I can take a look at all the apps that I've got. I know I have paid for apps in the past and I don't use all of the apps on my phone uh, like regularly. Like Fly Delta, I flew Delta one time and I've still got the app on my phone. Uh, but I know there are a couple of apps that I have paid for, at least a couple. Um, and so I'm going to want to sign in eventually. So I'll go ahead and do it now since I am setting the phone up. Um, okay, so sign in with your Google account. And once again, it, it's only going to share uh, accounts with the Aurora store if you're setting up an anonymous account for them. If you're signing in, then it's not going to share your account. So I'll go ahead and sign in here. All right. Yeah, my Google account password is one of my most secure passwords out of any of my accounts that I have because it's connected to YouTube and all kinds of other things. Um, I need to verify that it's me with my old phone, which would be an issue if I didn't have my old phone. I guess I've got other methods that I could use, but we'll connect here. Um, my old phone no longer has a SIM card. Hopefully it can do this over Wi-Fi if it will connect to my new Wi-Fi setup. All right, so we're connected to Wi-Fi. My old phone's been freezing up a little bit just within the past couple days. And it's almost like it knew I was getting a new phone and it was cranky because I've never had any freezing issues with it before. And I don't know why I would start now. Oh, no, that's not the notification I was looking for. Here we go. Here's the Google Play notification. Are you trying to sign in? Yes. Yeah, system UI isn't responding. I don't know what's going on. This is just the default uh, Oxygen OS ROM that came on the OnePlus 5T. So you can see, you know, even if Yode has bugs, they're not the only ones having bugs. Um, that happens even with manufacturer-created operating systems. Uh, we published the Google Terms of Service, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I agree. Okay, so now we are signed into the Aurora store. And it's giving me uh, suggestions. None of these apps are things that I want. I do not want any of these apps. Do not show me any of these apps. Uh, can I see my own apps? Can I browse my apps and games? Library. Okay, so I've got like a history of things that I've installed. And then I've got purchase history. Interesting. And that includes apps that I got for free during like deals where they were giving away free apps. Um, but I've got that now. So if I go back into the Aurora store, actually, so we've only got two apps installed that the Aurora store recognizes, Google Play Services and Magic Earth Navigation and Maps. Once again, they mentioned that this one is not open source, and so that's why it would not show up in F-Droid. If I go to F-Droid, the other app store, um, it's a little bit clunkier. Like I said, I've used it on my tablet. Um, it's got some really great apps, and you can actually find some apps that have advertisements or require payments to enable extra features on Google Play, but then you can get the full version of the app for free on F-Droid. Obviously, if you use the app and you like it, you should go and donate if you're using it from F-Droid. But F-Droid works a little bit more like a Linux package manager. You can see it's downloading, it's updating repositories uh, for all 3,809 apps in F-Droid, and when it gets done, then it will show you the apps uh, with a little bit of a different setup. It looks like we don't have any, oh, and I just, I started a refresh again. So it's going to, once again, it's like if you run a, a sudo apt update on Ubuntu, it's gonna go and download all of its metadata again. Uh, but we're gonna slowly load in some icons here in F-Droid. Like I said, just a little bit more clunky. Um, the updates show up here. It looks like the Yode browser comes from F-Droid. They probably have their own. If we go to settings repositories, yeah, we've got the default F-Droid repository and then we've also got Yode's repository. So this would be the equivalent of a PPA on uh, an Ubuntu-based system or a, you know, a repository on a Debian uh, or any Linux desktop system where Yode is going to be shipping their own apps through a repository that integrates into the wider F-Droid package manager. Um, so that's pretty cool that it works like that. Uh, however, you do have to come in here. It looks like it was actually installing some updates automatically, which is nice. Uh, with my tablet, I have to manually update every single one in F-Droid, so it can be a bit of a pain. Um, I do want to know this Discover Trust notification showed up pretty quickly after I initially finished setting this thing up. I don't know if this is a Yode thing. I think it's just an Android thing. Um, the trust icon will only show when the contents of the page have been verified. Uh, it might not even be a Yode thing so much as a Lineage OS thing. Oh, and it's gone. 
that was super clunky. Did you see that? I was trying to find information about that, and then I tapped the back button, and it just completely went away. Okay, well, yeah, I guess I guess we don't need more information about that feature if it's not a Yode thing. Uh, we will go ahead. We got a MicroG Services Core app update. So that answers my question. We do not need or we should not need to update the Google Play services via the recovery system that's going to handle this operating system update because it looks like they come through F-Droid, which is nice. Uh, if we come into Yode OS, we're going to tap install. You're about to install Yode OS 2.4 from April 8th, 2022. I thought it was from the 12th, the latest update. We're going to tap OK, though. Uh, preliminary update preparation. And let's see what this looks like. Preparing to update. Pretty well integrated so far. I'm really curious what the recovery is going to look like, just because I've used a few different recoveries in the past. And some of them are more graphical, and some of them are more text-based. We do have an unlocked symbol at the top. I assume that means the phone is unlocked, uh, bootloader's unlocked from shipment. Okay, this is a pretty nice animation. That is the Lineage OS logo. So I assume that this is using just the Lineage OS recovery, uh, which like I said, I've got some experience with Lineage OS recovery. Uh, I've mainly used Twerp. Um, and before that, you know, Clockwork Mod and things like that. But very nice that they're using that integrated Lineage OS updater uh, because it, it clearly works pretty smoothly. All right, so it looks like that update did complete and we are just rebooting again now. Pretty nice boot animation there. Okay, uh, and it looks like uh, the operating system at this boot has started picking up. Oh, nope, it went back to, uh, the carrier said Ting for a second there, which was nice, uh, but then it went back to T-Mobile. It doesn't actually matter too much to me. Oh, I'll type in my temporary pattern. Uh, it doesn't matter too much to me if it reports the carrier correctly, but you know, things like voicemail can sometimes get a little wonky if it uh, thinks that I'm actually on T-Mobile and is not aware of Ting. Um, okay, so we've got the, the phone here. We already saw a little bit of the web browser. We've got a search box there. Uh, when we try to use the search box, we can choose a theme. Uh, yeah, it's set to automatic by default, which is fine. Toolbar placement, privacy, start browsing. And part of the reason I hate Firefox, because I've immediately got pocket recommended clickbait shoved into my face. This is why I do not like Mozilla and I do not like Firefox. Can we turn those off in mobile Firefox or is that only on yeah, thought provoking stories? It provokes the exact thoughts that Mozilla wants you to have. Um, where is our menu for Firefox? Customize homepage. Pocket, turn that off. Opening screen, last tab. That's interesting. Why would they assume that you don't want to restore your previous session if you wait more than four hours uh, since you had it open? That's an interesting, that, that just lets you basically forget about tabs that you had open while still having some short-term persistence. That, that I've never seen that setting before. Um, I assume that's just a Firefox thing and not a Yoda thing. Okay, if we go back here, all right, we, we've got the clickbait articles gone now at least. Uh, the default search engine, if we just search nerd on, do we have, uh, nope, we don't have swiping on the keyboard by default. I did go ahead and enable vibration on the keyboard because it makes makes it feel a little better for me to type on. Uh, the default search engine is Quaint, which is, uh, according to Quaint, a privacy respecting search engine. If we go to the about tab, um, I, I'd have to look up what Quaint actually gets its results from. Uh, if, it, if it scrapes Google or Bing, you know, DuckDuckGo basically scrapes Bing, start page scrapes Google, or proxies to Google. Brave Web Browser actually has their own search engine now that is uh, using their own indexer, which is pretty crazy. But yeah, I'll, I'll have to look up more information about this one. But yeah, we've got that web browser. Uh, we can take a quick look at the camera here because that's something I know I'm going to use this weekend. Uh, it looks like we've got some kind of We've got like a timestamp in the top left. It's telling me, uh, it's telling, it's giving me like statistics about my lighting and things like that. And then in addition, it's got the current time um, and it's got how much free space is on the device. If I take a quick picture, um, does that stuff show up in the photo? No, it does not. Good. Uh, it looks like we, we've got a button there to circle that around. You can see 
me there and the selfie camera and then the camera that I'm using to record the video. Uh, so yeah, the camera viewfinder is a little small. I don't know why there's so much space on either side of this. This is just, I think, a default. Actually, what was the app called? Open camera. Uh, version 1.49.2 iode.3. So this is an app that they are specifically packaging at least. Um, it looks like they're building the app. I don't know if they're patching it at all. But yeah, if we take a look at this next to like my OnePlus 5T, um, uh, I, guess, I guess the viewfinder is similarly cropped on both. Um, I think it looks more out of place on the new phone because for one thing, the, the zoom slider is extending into the camera frame. On my old phone, it had a little arrow pointing up from where you can swipe some of those options into view, uh, and that arrow is animated if you look closely, swiping it up and down. Uh, the new phone does not have any swipeable options, it looks like, and the top really is where a lot of the wasted space is. It looks like they tried to center uh, the viewfinder on the screen, but it really doesn't work because we've got buttons down here taking up more space, and the buttons up at the top uh, don't really take up much space at all. Now, if we go to the video section on the 5T, you can see it actually extends the viewfinder behind the capture button um, over here on the Xiaomi. Okay, it does something similar. Once again, though, uh, it's cutting off the viewfinder in the middle of buttons so it doesn't look quite as polished. So I know Yode didn't create this open camera app from scratch, or they probably didn't. They're probably repackaging an open camera app, uh, and that's perfectly fine. If they're going to contribute to it, I would maybe, you know, take a look at the camera app, take a look at if you can make any of this just arranged a little bit nicer than what we've got right now. The white balance does look better on the left than on the right, uh, so that's nice. The You know, my, my lighting in here is admittedly kind of bad because my... I'm using regular old light bulbs, which have kind of a yellow tint to them. Um, and the open camera app is adjusting for that and giving me more of a white, white balance. Whereas my OnePlus 5T may be a little bit more accurate, but it doesn't look as nice um, with more of a yellow tint. So that is interesting. Uh, I will have to play around with the camera. Obviously, I'll be getting some pictures of things this weekend that I can use as references for how, how nice the quality is. So now that we've installed that update, uh, one last thing that I want to take a look at, um, if we go into the Aurora store, I am curious actually what it looks like if we install something. So let's take an app that I know I'm going to want that I know is not in F-Droid, uh, and I'm going to use Discord for that purpose because I know Discord is not an open source app and it's not going to be an F-Droid. So if I search Discord, I'm gonna search for that, and just to confirm, actually, we can go over to F-Droid and we can search for the same thing, Discord. And yeah, nothing showing up for Discord there. Um, so we can go over to Aurora and we can install Discord from there. Um, so it should download it from Google Play. And that is a large progress bar that is moving a little slowly, uh, but that is about the speed I would expect from my Wi-Fi which is good to see since I did just rebuild the access point on my computer. So I'm curious to see what kind of prompt we're going to get when this is done to confirm that we want to install this. Uh, it looks like we can read Google Play reviews, so that's good. Oh, we have the option to join a, a beta program. Not something I've seen before, but I assume that is from Google Play, so they're supporting that functionality if that's something that you care about. Okay, um, so we can, it, it did just install it. It did not prompt us whatsoever, so that's good. Uh, and then we've got Discord and I can log into it. Cool. And the last thing I wanna take a look at tonight, it's getting a little bit late here, but the last thing I wanna take a look at on camera is the Maps app. I did open it up earlier uh, because I, I turned off the Wi-Fi, turned on the data, and I was just going to use it to uh, go to something. I actually had a meetup that I attended earlier, just a board gaming thing, and I tried to use Magic Earth navigation to get there, but I opened it up and I searched. Uh, it was at a place called Enchanted Grounds. Map update now complete. I didn't see that earlier, so maybe that was part of the problem. Um, Enchanted rounds. So I searched for it earlier. Okay, so it found an enchanted grounds. But where is that at? That doesn't look like what I'm Yeah, that's see that's not a I don't think that's a United States address. Um <clears throat> privacy first. <laughs> okay. Actually, I I I'm kind of interested in the uh oh, okay. Now I now I can't see the details it was trying to show me before because I tapped out of it too quickly. 
you know, you should really be able to review and not just have a one time confirmation of, of this stuff. Um, permissions, location, allow only while using the app. Magic Earth. Okay. Okay, well, now it found me. It did find me with startling accuracy, so I'm going to swipe away a little bit uh, for the video here. But if I just search Enchanted Grounds a second time, earlier it found one of the two locations, but not the one I was going to. Yeah, so we've got near West Bulls Avenue, Littleton, Colorado. There are two Enchanted Grounds locations uh, in Denver, and one of them's in Littleton, the other one is in Highlands Ranch. Um, and I went to the Highlands Ranch location. So we've got an Enchanted Grounds place here, and I can, I can set up uh, navigation. Instead of using my position, because I don't want you to see my exact position, I'll use um, just another landmark I happen to know of here in Denver. That's the System 76 offices. Um, and that's not the correct address. <laughs> it says System 76 is near Champa Street, which is at least, at least one building prior to the current location where they're at, uh, because their current location, which is public information, is uh, it's in Montbello on a street called Carson Street, uh, not anywhere near downtown where it used to be. Um, so they've got outdated address for the company that I'm using as a random example of a starting position, and then they've got only one out of the two locations for the place I was searching for. Um, what does demo mean? Okay. Oh, so it's simulating the route, so you can kind of watch yourself drive. That's kind of cool, I guess. Stop current demo. Oh, and then it got rid of the directions. Okay. Well, that was weird. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a problem that, that it doesn't have all of the locations. You know, when I searched Enchanted Grounds on Google Maps on my other phone, I, it, it gave me the option just between the two locations. I didn't have to think about it at all. Uh, Enchanted... Grounds, Highlands, Ranch. Nope, it's still just taking me to the one uh, in Littleton. So that might be a problem. Um, the good news is if we go into the Aurora store, we should be able to actually install Google Maps from here if I need it. It would be a little bit of a bummer to have to use Google Maps on such a otherwise privacy respecting phone. Uh, but at least with Yode, I should be able to have a reasonable um, expectation that Google Maps will not be tracking my location when I'm not actively using it because of the operating system level protections. And I should also get some interesting statistics about requests that it is making um, and when it's making them. So that might be better than nothing. Uh, what exactly is the source for the data in this app, I wonder? We've got like speed limit warnings and things like that. All maps, okay, interesting. So I tapped this download button and it opens up what appears to be a place where I can download different maps. And if I search United States, okay, so we've got United States, 15 gigabytes, Colorado, 352 megabytes. I, I honestly would want all of the maps. <laughs> You know, because like I drive, when I drive from Colorado to Missouri, I've got Kansas in the middle, but like I've driven to Texas before. Um, I haven't driven to New York, but I've been to New York, you know, and I don't want to have to worry about pre-downloading maps before I go to a place, but I guess I'm going to download some of these and see if that makes a difference. Oh, I just, okay. So United States actually includes most of these, it looks like, because I tapped download on one and it started uh, downloading the rest of them. And Colorado, it looks like, for example... Oh, I'm not sure what these, these double boxes mean. Maybe it will only do a couple at a time. Um, but yeah, I mean, even when I travel to other countries, which I will do eventually, uh, I'm going to want maps working. So I'm going to download this. I'm going to see if the accuracy gets any better. Uh, but aside from that, I am also going to, like I said, I'm going to use this phone. I'm going to seek out any cool privacy features that I, that I can find this weekend while I'm at that convention. And then I will report back to you guys at the end of this video, just any first impressions from that first weekend of using Yode. Um, I am probably going to clean this thing off a bit first, and then I will pop it into this case uh, semi-permanently. Let me turn the screen off here, I guess. 
there we go. Um, the phone just snaps into the case really easily, but it, it doesn't feel like it's gonna fall out or anything. Um, and the case actually feels pretty nice. It feels a little bit bulky. This phone is bigger than my OnePlus 5T. Obviously, they sell smaller phones. Yode sells smaller phones if you want a smaller phone. Yeah, compared to what I'm coming from, it's uh, taller, as you can see. It is not really much wider at all. Um, it's about the same width, uh, but it is significantly thicker, especially with the case. But even without the case, it's a bit thicker than the old phone. But yeah, I am very excited to, uh, to see how this thing works. So like I said, I will let you guys know how it's working after a couple of days using it. All right, guys, I used this phone as my daily driver for several weeks, and I learned a lot about Yode in that process. I actually have so much to say that I don't wanna just stick the review at the end of this unboxing video. I'm going to make a separate video just about the review of the phone, really deep diving into a lot of the experiences that I had with it. Now, don't worry, this is not going to be one of those things where you're waiting on the next part of the video for months, because I know I've got other series on the channel that are still kind of running. The review for this phone and Yode OS as a whole will be out later this this week. So stay tuned, stay subscribed, check back on the website if you're watching there. I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd in the Street, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.